Hey, what's up? I'm Ujemma and welcome back to my channel. A functor is a data structure that's able to be mapped over by exposing its own mapping interface, which is typically a function that lives on that functor. This is a nice high level definition of what a functor is, but it doesn't really answer the more important question of why we should know about functors and how to use functors. So in this video, my main goal is to show you the importance of functors and why it's super helpful to understand what they are and how they work so you can take advantage of them in your projects. More specifically, we'll first take a high level look at functors by working with the built-in functor array, and then we'll get more technical by understanding the functor laws. After that, we'll take a look at another built-in JavaScript functor, which is promise. And finally, we'll get our hands dirty by creating our own custom functor. Functors is a popular topic in functional programming. If you aren't too familiar with or comfortable learning about functional programming, I recommend that you go watch some of my other functional programming videos before you hop into this video. But if you're already comfortable with learning more about functional programming, let's take a closer look at functors. So as I mentioned before, a functor is a data structure that can be mapped over with the use of a mapping interface. More specifically, a functor is a type of wrapper object that wraps around data and then implements a custom mapping function. When called, this function exposes the functor internal data that developers can now use to transform into new data and then wrap that new data back into another functor. It's a whole process. But now you might be asking yourself, what does a functor actually look like in JavaScript? To answer that question, let's take a closer look at the built-in array object. So in this code block, I have an array named people, and my people array is actually my functor because it's a container of data, which are my people strings, and it implements a mapping interface, which is the map method. So after initializing the people array, I map over it so I can create a new functor, which is again, just another array that contains newly transformed values. And I assign those new values to people greetings. The arrays map method exposes each string, which gives us the developer the opportunity to create a new value from those internal strings. Once we're all done stepping through each internal value in the people array, we create a new array, which wraps around our new values. So this is the basic nature of a functor. It's a wrapper around some data, and then you can expose that data with a mapping interface. And then a developer can mutate that new data and then wrap it again into a new functor. And this process can continue. So this is a prime example of a functor in action, but let's take a look at the functor laws so we can get a more technical understanding of what makes a functor a functor. So there are two laws that a functor has to follow to be considered a functor. So the two laws are the identity and composition laws. Let's take a closer look at the identity law first. It states that if you pass in an identity function into your functor's mapping interface, the final return collection should be equivalent to your original functor. This also means that the return collection has to be another functor. So let's take a closer look at a code block. Looking back at our last code block, I changed the callback method inside the map method. So now I'm just returning the current person string. This callback is an identity function since it just returns the person string without changing its value. So the final equal to people array contains all the same values found in our original people array, which is still a functor, so the identity rule checks out. Next up is the composition law, which states that the method call of map on a functor, where for each x, we pass an x to the g method, which we then pass into the f method, should be the same as calling a chain of map methods on a functor, where each callback is our custom g and f methods. This is the best technical working definition of the composition law, but it makes a lot more sense when we take a closer look at it. Best way that I interpret what this rule is trying to say is that when it's being followed, you can convert nested method calls into a chain of method calls. The first function call of f map, and then for each x, we pass x into g, and then we pass g into f, is all good for functionality. But when it comes to reading or debugging code that has nested method calls, it just gets a little bit more tricky, especially when you start introducing extra layers of logic or complexity. Whereas for chaining method calls, we're able to get the same functionality, but it's a lot easier on the eyes to read. And chaining method calls like this isn't just easier to read, it's also easier to debug so you can quickly find errors or even to refactor code when you want to change or remove or even add something to your code. But let's make this explanation more clear by looking at a code block. Here I have two methods, add one and times two, that take in a numerical value and then return a new value according to their names. You can think of add one as our f method and times two as our g method. Right below that, I have an array named numbers that contains the numbers one, two, and three. Then I map over the numbers array, where for each item in the array, I return the nested method calls. The enter method is times two, which returns the new number into our add one method, and then that final value gets inserted into our final array. 
This will return out a new array with the values 3, 5, and 7 since we multiplied each number by 2 and then added 1. Again, this is all right in terms of focusing on reaching functionality, but when it comes to reading through this, it's not as easy to sift through. So let's take a look at how we can achieve the same final array, but with chaining methods. In this code block, I added a new array named chain numbers, which comes from us calling a series of map methods instead of just one large map method. Since arrays follow the functor composition law, by chaining our map methods, we're able to get the same final array. The main goal of the functor composition law, or in other terms, function composition, is to abstract away as much logic into small, easily chainable methods. So instead of nesting functions, which can become more complex as your application grows in size, you can just chain all your function calls together, which is a lot easier to read. Let me show you another example of this. So in this code block, I made a number of changes to show how it can become challenging to debug with nested functions. In my times two method, I changed multiplying by two to multiplying by three to emulate a bug. I've also added a new method called exponent two, just to introduce an extra layer of complexity. Just taking a quick look at how we're creating nested numbers and chain numbers, which line do you want to debug? Personally, I would love debugging chain numbers since all I would have to do for debugging is work from the end of the line all the way up to the beginning to find the problematic method. So hopefully by this point, you should start seeing how functors work and how they're pretty beneficial. Let's take a look at the promise object, which is also a functor. Promises are also functors because they implement their own mapping interface. Unlike arrays, their mapping interface isn't called map, but it's called then. So when you call then on a promise, what you're able to do is grab hold of the resolved data from that promise. And then inside that then method, you can handle the data however you like. And then after that, then returns a new promise so you can continue a chain of then methods. Let me show you an example of how this could work. Here we can see that I'm chaining my initial promise with then methods, which when called return another promise object that can take another then method. As I mentioned before, functor is a container, a collection of data. And here we can see for each promise that we create, it contains data that we can work with and then return to the next then method. So for my initial promise object, I resolve the number one. And then in my first then callback, I return my result plus one. And then in our next then callback, I return our result times two. So again, we're creating a chain of then methods, which is really easy to read, especially if we start creating self-documenting functions. So in this new code block here, you can see that I'm still creating another promise and resolving the value one. And then I'm passing in our custom add one and times two methods, which is just a lot easier to read, especially if we're chaining a lot of then callbacks. Having all of our then methods in a flat chain is just a lot easier to read, debug, and to refactor. So if you made it this far in the video, you're doing pretty good. Functors can be a complex topic when you first get exposed to it. And to make all this learning worth it, we're gonna play around with creating our own functor. So in this next code block, you'll see my personal implementation of a functor and I'll walk through it with you. Okay, so here we're dealing with a bare bones example of a functor. Our functor method takes in a value and then returns an object that has a map key. This map key has the value of a function expression that takes in another function and returns a new functor instance with a newly provided value. So here we can see that we're following the identity law because we can pass in a function that can simply return out the same value, which will then be inserted into another functor that will be returned back to use. Just to keep track of the values that we're dealing with, I implemented the value key so we can see what value our functor is holding at a given time. So right after initializing our functor method, I call it by passing in the cowboy emoji, which returns a new functor instance. If I print it out, I can see that I have my value cowboy emoji along with the map method that I can call. And this is our functor. If I call cowboy functors map method, I can create an entirely new transform functor that now has the new value that I passed into the map method. So we can continue this process of creating a new functor from a previous functor. And if you wanted to spice up your functors a little bit, you can inject extra functionality, like making it iterable. So here you can see that I expose the functor method symbol iterator key and assigned it to a generator function that yields the value that was passed in initially into our functor. If you aren't too familiar with iterables or generators, I made a video that covers that topic. Since our functor instance is now iterable, we can spread it into arrays, objects, or even loop through it with a for of loop. 
So the greatest benefit of using functors, in my opinion, is function composition. The fact that you can chain methods together is just so much easier to read and just sift through, especially if you're dealing with complex code bases. So after we've walked through arrays and promises and even creating your own functors, what do you do with this newfound knowledge? I feel like a lot of developers don't get the chance to create functors from scratch just because there's a lot of pre-built functors already out there. But I think the most beneficial thing that you can do with this newfound functor knowledge is have the ability to identify functors in your code base and be able to take advantage of function composition. But that's it for this video. Let me know if you want to learn more about functors in the comment section below. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Drop a like if you enjoyed what you saw and subscribe to the channel for more JavaScript content. I'm also on Twitter where I talk about JavaScript. You can send me a DM, ask me questions, we can have a chat. With that, I'll see you all in the next one.